All right, people are there already. So, hey, everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest today is one of my very favorite people in the whole world from whom everything I've learned from, well, that doesn't make sense. I've learned, I can't speak English today. It's too early, Dr. Goldhammer. Usually I don't do this till noon. So everything I've learned, I've learned pretty much from this person and also from Dr. Lyle and Dr. McDougall. Please welcome Dr. Ellen Goldhammer. Dr. Goldhammer is the co-founder of the True North Health Center located in Santa Rosa, California, and the co-author of my favorite book of all time, which soon will be released on audio, both in CD and on Audible. Welcome, Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, and thank you for doing such a good job on turning the pleasure trap into an audible presentation. Oh, well, thank I appreciate you. that. Well, thank you for having the idea for that because it's long overdue. You know, I, I used to teach the blind. I was a volunteer culinary instructor at the Braille Institute, and your book is so important, but they couldn't read it because it wasn't on Braille. And so now not, now not only the blind can read it, but um, the rest of us who are dumb. <laughs> well, and really you know, people spend a lot of time trapped in their cars and other things, so now it's a way for them to integrate the information from the pleasure trap without having to uh, use up uh, otherwise productive otherwise productive time. Now they can use time that would be otherwise less productive. Yeah. And if anybody wonders why I'm the voice actor is because neither Dr. Goldhammer nor Dr. Lyle had the time to do it. And, and I, I somewhat understood the material. So that's why. So I was very honored to do that. And it's being it's being edited right now. So it'll be released very soon. So make sure you're on either my mailing list or Dr. Goldhammer's mailing list or both. So you'll be notified when we have the launch. Sharon says she's very excited for this interview. So great. So Dr. Goldhammer, I get asked a lot of the same questions over and over. And at first, what I thought I was going to do is discuss the top 10 things I learned from you. And if there's time, we can go over these and why they're so important. But I do get a lot of the same questions over and over. And because I'm not a doctor, it doesn't really matter what I say. And I know you're really good at answering lots of questions quickly. So I thought I would just uh, fire. But but from what I understand from you, whatever the question, fasting's the answer, right? <laughs> Pretty yeah. much. Well, Pretty we have an article. It's called "Fasting is the Answer." What's the question? And there's some some truth to that, right? Well, it, it sure helps a lot of things. And so, actually, the first question is on fasting. Do you think it's really safe for people to do a water fast at home, especially if they continue to work at their job? Yeah, absolutely not. Fasting. Uh, part of uh, the important aspect of fasting is that people get rest. Mm -hmm. um, so even if a person is otherwise a good candidate, in other words, they're not on medication, they don't have health history issues that are contraindicated, they've established baseline data, so they have something to compare back to, it still would not be appropriate to fast while a person is working. Um, what ends up happening in fasting is the body changes from burning glucose, which is your main fuel, to burning fat. Uh, that in itself is fine, but the brain itself still has some minimal needs it has in order to be able to continue to burn glucose. And the brain, of course, is your biggest burner of glucose overall. So if you're too active in fasting, mentally or physically, your brain will continue and your muscles to require some glucose needs. And that glucose can't come from fat. It only comes from protein or carbohydrate. So once you've depleted your carbohydrate reserves, your glycogen reserves, the only way the, the body is able to continue to carry on is by breaking down protein. So if you rest when you fast, you minimize that and you focus on burning fat. But if you're too active, like going to work or being too engaged, what happens is your body will need more glucose needs, therefore break down more protein, less fat. That's not what you want to do. You want to preserve your protein, burn, <coughs> excuse me, burn your fat, and goes through a detox process. And so resting and fasting are an important uh, corollaries. So, so Shirley writes that she's doing a 24-hour fast twice a week. Is that okay? Well, it's a little different situation. Now we're talking about intermittent fasting or short-term fasting. I still wouldn't recommend uh, beyond what we the, – the, the intermittent fasting where people limit their feeding windows to 8 hours or 10 hours or whatever it is that's appropriate for that person – that can be done safely and effectively. That doesn't prevent people from working. But once we, when I talk about fasting, I'm not talking about a narrowed fiendal window. I'm talking about a more extended period of time of deprivation. And I don't think that the, the benefit versus the physiological price uh, typically favors 24-hour fasting. So mm -hmm. I think that when we advocate this 16-hour fasting in conjunction with a short feeding window, people do very well with that. When we start talking about extended fasting, where we go on for days or weeks, then 
that's where the rules about fasting have to be applied. Mm -hmm. So the intermittent fasting, or as you often call it, the intermittent feeding, yes. narrowing that eating window to maybe six or eight hours a day, or I believe at True North, it's like a nine hour window because you have your first meal at 8.30 and then you finish your last mm -hmm. meal there. So if somebody chose to eat their three meals at 5.30, does, it, does the time matter? I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? Or like maybe some people go to bed earlier or some people stay up later. Does it, does the, do those hours matter? Well, I don't think the absolute With hours matter as much as the fact that there be some time between your final meal and sleep. Right. So, and that's one of the things I always tell people, because right now in my Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we're doing a challenge in March just not to eat after dinner. Don't you think there needs to be a certain amount of hours regardless uh, for people to finish eating before they go to bed? Just well, for think, yeah, there's some variation individual to individual. Some people have very rapid and efficient digestive systems, et cetera. But generally having a couple or three hours of time pass between the end of your final meal and, and – um, uh, hopefully their sl appropriate sleep time is, I think, an ideal situation. I wouldn't have a person, for example, stay up late necessarily. What I'd rather them do is just eating earlier. Right, exactly. You know, Thank you. Because like, so many people just eat into the night and that, you know, they eat more, it seems like they almost eat more well, food between dinner and sleep. Of course they do because they're fatigued. At the end of the day, they're exhausted and instead of going to sleep, <laughs> they stimulate themselves with eating and feel better and so make an error of attribution and decide they must have been hungry. They weren't hungry. They were tired. Right. When you're well, tired, about, you should rest. When you're hungry, you should eat. What about these people that say, oh, well, I can't sleep if I'm hungry? Well, I think there's some truth to that. And it, the reason they're hungry a lot of times is because they're eating sugary processed crap. And so their blood insulin and blood sugar levels are bouncing all over the place. And so they're getting a hypoglycemic response after their evening meal, which they try to placate with more drug-like effects. Rather than do that, what you should do is eat a whole plant food SOS-free diet, which will help you eventually stabilize your blood sugar and insulin levels, and then the cravings and a lot of this other stuff tend to become less of an issue. Great. Thank you. Uh, someone live commented, Shannon, that she found out <coughs> severely anemic. Is it okay for her to fast or do intermittent fasting? Well, we need to first of all determine what, what the cause of the, inter, the anemia is. Some people are anemic because they're not uh, consuming an appropriate diet, and so they're not producing right blood cells. Most people are anemic because they're leaking. They have excessively heavy periods, or they're, they have bleeding from their kidneys or their colon. So the answer is to stop the source of leaking. Uh, so I think the first step before we comment on what's the best way to treat it is to identify exactly what type of anemia it is. Some people have anemia where the cells are very small. Some of them have cells are overly large. They have what's called macrocytic anemia because they don't get enough B12. Um, and, you know, that is a legitimate concern for our vegan patients. They're not getting feces-contaminated, dead-decaying flesh sources of B12, so they need to use a supplemental B12. We recommend 1,000 micrograms a day of methylcobalamin. And that'll basically take care of all vegans' needs for B12. And then they don't develop the anemia associated with B12 deficiency. Mm, nice. Thank you. So we, we, got, we got a lot of questions about allergies because people are saying that their practitioners are telling them that, that they can develop allergies for foods if they consume the same food too often. Uh, have you ever heard of that? So something about the effect of... Um, develop a sensitivity to a food from eating it too frequently like grains. Is, is that true? It is true. The fact that uh, repeat exposure to something that is naturally antagonistic to you may eventually manifest symptoms. For example, let's say you're a bit sensitive to lectins or some other protein in grains or beans, okay. but you expose yourself to those rarely. You're less likely to have any symptoms associated with that exposure. You expose yourself every day and you may develop more and more of a vigorous immunological response to those substances. And this is one of the rationales behind uh, rotational feeding. Uh, so even if a person has a bit of a sensitivity or tendency, if they rotate their foods, they may be able to mitigate that and not have it be a limiting factor. So other people are so sensitive, for example, to gluten, that they just can't have any exposure at all. But, you know, and that's a, you know, a pretty obvious situation, but there are there are many people that, can handle some limited exposure, periodic exposure without having any symptoms. 
but wouldn't do well if they tried to overconsume that substance every day. On the other hand, for most whole natural foods, people can eat large amounts of exposure during the seasons and you know most things come in and out of season and there's kind of a natural opportunity for the body to get a break from constant exposure. I don't know that it ever makes sense to eat exactly the same thing each and every day, each and every time all year round. There's probably some inherent benefit to rotating food in our diets. But if I understand you correctly, Dr. Goldhammer, it, 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 you're not going to develop an allergy for something you're not sensitive to. So, for example, I eat zucchini every day, I, and I, am I going to become allergic to it because I like it and I eat it every day? Right. Unless it's you not have, that that's all I eat. Right? Yeah, unless you have an underlying uh, vulnerability to some of the proteins in that food, it's very unlikely you're going to develop sensitivity just because of repeat exposure. Right. So, 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 so it is because they have some vulnerability or sensitivity. It's not because they ate that food often. Well, it's also maybe- foods like zucchini are very low antigenic foods. I, I doubt that there's too many people who are going to develop sensitivities to, to zucchini routinely, right. even with repeat exposure. Right. Um, although you could make the case that, you know, maybe, you know, some seasons you have zucchini, some season it might be yellow squash. Or, you know, there's right. other types of similar squashes that might not be bad to rotate in there. No, I, I do change them but, up, but, 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 but the idea is, is there, there probably wasn't underlying. The idea is that people get because- gut leakage when they develop allergies. And it, what makes it worse sometimes is re- repeat exposure to proteins that they may have an underlying sensitivity to. Okay. I got it. So, so what do you, what do you think is the best way to treat and diagnose uh, these allergies? Go go to a water fast because a lot of people do those those skin prick tests with their uh, uh, immunologist, and then they come back with a list of like forty foods that, they, that they're telling them not to eat. And well, so, what do you think the skin prick of tests are notoriously unreliable as food allergens? They're they're not so bad for looking at environmental allergens, mm-hmm. but you wouldn't use skin prick testing as any kind of reliable means of assessing food sensitivities. There are blood-based tests that are expensive and maybe a little bit more sensitive, the ALCAT tests, et cetera, that many people use to identify food sensitivities. There's a lot of false negative and false positive that's associated with all this. A lot of it depends on how much exposure you've had, if you've had repeat exposure. Allergy testing can be a little tricky. Right. The best thing I find is a more of a functional assessment, which is we take all of the antigens out of the diet that's what we call fasting Mm -hmm. and fast until all the symptoms clear and then rotate food in and watch and see whether or not foods present untoward symptomology. And that may be the most reliable way of identifying foods you may have sensitivity to, or just, you know, eliminating those class of foods that you know you have sensitivities to and focus on the healthy starch, starch starch-based vegetables that generally people do very well with. Right. Well, do you think bloating is is a symptom of a food allergy? Because there seems to be so many people, women especially now, that just have just unrelenting bloating from eating. Well, I want you to think about this, uh, AJ. You've got five pounds of bacteria on average that live in your intestinal tract. Five pounds. That's like an organ. That's like having a liver. It's like a kidney. It's a big deal. And those are living creatures. And they're eating and respirating and pooing inside your intestinal tract every day. So you got this five pound alien, so to speak, living inside you. And that alien gives off different types of poo depending on what you feed it. If you feed it soluble fiber, you're gonna get fertilizer, you're getting your vitamin K and all kinds of important nutrients and it's gonna work to help protect you against other nasty critters, protozoan and viruses and all kinds of issues. But if you feed that bacterial monster things like meat, you're going to get products like TMA, which becomes TMAO, trimethylamine oxidase, which is a highly irritating inflammatory product associated with things like heart disease and possibly cancer, etc. So you want to be feeding your bacteria the right kind of food and not the wrong kind of food, not the sugar and the animal foods and all the processed, heated, beaded, treated, chopped crap that most people live on. So it's not surprising to me that people have all kinds of problems with bloating and uh, digestive difficulties and gut leakage because they've been poisoning themselves both with what they eat and what happens as a consequence of what they eat. So I think the first step would be let's get rid of the meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, all salt and sugar that tend to disrupt the normal bacterial flora. 
and give ourselves a whole plant food SOS free diet and see how well a lot of these symptoms mitigate. Now, in some cases, it takes a long time and you might want to speed it up. And that's where we do medically supervised water only fasting to kind of reboot the system and then do exactly the same thing. In other cases, if you just feed properly, it corrects itself. And, you know, a lot of times, especially now, True North Health is so far booked ahead. You know, it's taking us two months or three months to get people in. The annoying thing I've been finding is an awful lot of people by following this whole plant food SOS free diet, before they even get in, they go and get well. Right. There's nothing left for us to do. It's it's so yeah. annoying. Right. But uh, the bottom line is that if you can't get it done quick enough, sometimes we'll do it faster with fasting. What do you think of like people on their own while they're waiting to get into True North doing like somewhat of an elimination diet at home, just eating like maybe one starch, like sweet potatoes and one vegetable like zucchini? Well, I recommend or, everybody do an elimination diet. It's called a whole plant food SOS free diet that eliminates meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, oil, salt, and sugar. I'm asking people already to eliminate 93% on average of the calories that they consume, the things they drink, the things they eat the things they shouldn't eat, and instead put them on an elimination diet, eliminating all that stuff, and in exchange, whole plant foods that are free of salt, oil, and sugar. So things like fruit and things like vegetables, both raw and cooked. So I think that is an elimination diet. Now, if you're talking about going into an even more restricted, like mono diet, whatever, you know, that if that rings your bell, you know, I don't have any problem with that per se, although I think that for most people, it's a challenge enough just getting them to get up in the morning and have some fruit and greens or some steamed vegetables or some starchy squash and to have salad and steamed vegetables and potatoes uh, and, and other, other types of uh, vegetable materials at lunch and dinner um, without necessarily, you know, even restricting it further. I think, and that's usually good enough that it seems to get the job done pretty well. Well, you, you just mentioned mono diet, so you think even just eating potatoes is okay? I think just eating any whole natural food uh, diet uh, can be a helpful intervention. So if a person wants to eat potatoes for a day and just, just see how that does for them, I think that's a perfectly reasonable uh, but, but intervention. But I meant like some people are doing it for a month and longer. Well, they can certainly do that. I don't know that it's an ideal situation. I think having a variety of fruit and vegetables... Uh, and the diet provides a lot of benefits. But if you're asking, can a person stay healthy eating nothing but potatoes for a month? Well, sure, people can do that. Cool. Excellent. I don't know that well, I would what, recommend, recommend that as the routine. Right. What do you attribute the popularity of the high-fat ketogenic diet these days? Well, because people love to get good news about their bad habits. Anytime you tell people they can eat pork rinds and greasy, slimy, dead decaying flesh, they're going to be thrilled about it. And the, the paleo type diets have a tremendous advantage in the sense that by putting in large amounts of fat and uh, protein and not carbohydrates, you will go into ketosis, which means you're going to be shifting over to burning fat because there is no carbohydrate, your natural fuel mm -hmm. to live on. And that has a hunger blunting effect. And that's the same kind of hunger blunting effect you see in fasting. That's why people after two or three days of fasting no longer have any hunger. Now, you wouldn't tell a person, well, we're just going to put you on a water fast only for, say, the next three years and see how that does, because eventually you'd run into issues. Um, and you wouldn't uh, recommend a person go on a paleo diet for an extended period of time because you'll run into issues. with. I mean, that evidence on that, it's very clear. Now, there's newer versions of that where they get the animal protein out of it and basically just put people on high-fat diets without carbohydrates to get the hunger blunting effect of that. And that may be somewhat less toxic than the traditional paleo high protein diets because I think there's pretty good consensus it's the animal proteins are highly detrimental uh, to health right, when presented in excess quantity. So, But something being less bad doesn't necessarily make it good. It just makes it somewhat less bad. Rather than saying, is this less bad than that or is this less bad, why don't we just do what's good? Why don't we just convince people? to adopt a whole plant food diet. Now, why don't we? I'll tell you why. Because unlike the, say, paleo diet, where you, you get this very quick hunger blunting effect, on a whole plant food diet, it takes a little bit longer because you have to go through a little detox effect. You've got to get used to doing this. You've got bacterial changes in the gut. That's why sometimes we'll use fasting first because fasting can make that transition from being miserable to being comfortable a little, happen a little quicker. 
But for people that are persistent, if they adopt a whole plant food diet, most of those desirous symptoms, that is to get rid of the cravings and the sugar drops and all that, go away anyway, whether they fast or they don't fast. If they just stick to a whole plant food diet long enough to give the body a chance to adjust. Well, Shirley's saying she loves this man. He tells it like it is. And thank you guys for sharing this broadcast right now in real time. Dr. Goldhammer, I, I forgot the L in your name when I was uh, publicizing this. So um, people are asking if that was a Freudian slip calling you Dr. Godhammer. <laughs> so uh, it, I think it was. So this question I get all the time, what's the best type of water to drink and how much daily? So the idea with water is you just want pure water. H2O. So anything you need to do to get your water, get rid of everything else in the water is desirable. So for example, you could use a filter. You could use a reverse osmosis membrane. You could use a steam distillation system. So anything that, that separates the water from all the hydrogenated halocarbons and the heavy metals and all the other contaminants is desirable. Now, the most efficient is steam distillation, and that's what we use at the center with fasting patients because they're very picky. You know, they can really pick up on the subtleties. But you can go Home Depot and get a triple filter system. You can get a reverse osmosis system. I would say you don't need to spend $6,000 to buy a magic system that's going to alkalize your water or change the, the spin of the water or anything else. You just need something to efficiently get rid of the stuff you don't want to be there. As far as how much to drink, you know, if people are eating a whole plant food SOS free diet, they're not going to need to drink as much exogenous water as they would if they were on some high protein animal based um, nitrogenous toxic waste diet because whole plant foods are abundant in water. And so you're getting a lot of water from your fruits and vegetables. And so you may not find yourself drinking, you know, X amount of glasses of water a day. On the other hand, staying hydrated is a really good thing. And so most people tend to underdo rather than overdo water. And so, you know, whether it's four glasses or eight glasses a day of water would depend on your diet, your exercise, how much you're sweating. You know, there's quite a bit of variation. It's like saying, how much are you supposed to eat? How much are you supposed to eat exactly? Well, it depends. You know, if you're five foot two and 90 years old and not that active, it might be different than if you're six foot four and 210 pounds and doing hard manual labor. You have to design and modify the diet to meet, meet the needs of the person. The same thing's true with water. Right. But you okay? want enough water that you're able to, for example, if you find your urine is very concentrated, that may be a sign you're not getting quite enough water. So it's nice to have urine that's not overly concentrated. If people have other signs of dehydration, obviously, then they, they may not be getting or retaining the water that they need. So drinking you know, enough water to be able to maintain a good hydration can be very, very helpful. So your pee should be kind of like a very faint yellow instead of a very... Yeah, it shouldn't be overly concentrated. If it is, then we wonder why, you know, what's going on there. Why is your kidneys having to work so hard? And right. of course, the first thing is get rid of the load on the kidneys by not eating meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, and all these highly processed foods. Of course, that's going to help in itself right there. Is it okay if some of your liquid intake comes from beverages that, I don't mean like coffee, tea, or soda, but for example, like uh, unsweetened hibiscus tea or pot liquor, which is basically just the liquid come, that comes from the steaming of greens? Is, is that yeah, okay? I like water, frankly. My, that's my personal preference. I think that, um, you know, as long as the source of the, for example, with teas, my concern is that, well, twofold. Number one, you wouldn't want to drink the tea of a plant you wouldn't eat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one thing. If you're thinking about some bitter, awful plant with all kinds of therapeutic modalities that, you know, drinking the broth of it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But on the other hand, if it's something you would chew on the leaves, you'd chew on peppermint leaves. So I don't see any great harm in having some peppermint tea. But remember when they, tea is a highly processed food product too. And so sometimes it's contaminated and the but, bags but, but, and chemicals that, and different what I was thinking of, Dr. Gregor recommends hibiscus tea. And literally <coughs> you take the flower and you put it in water. You're not, yeah, so it's not processed. If you're prepared to eat the plant or the flower, then I don't have a problem with the concept of the tea, but I wouldn't but, drink the tea. If are you okay with pot liquor? What pot liquor is, is it's just broth. It's vegetable broth, basically. Yeah, I don't know that I have a problem with that uh, as a... That's well, you problem. serve broth at True North for people as they're breaking the fast. D does If you have something like broth in the morning, is that taking you out of intermittent fasting because there is such a small amount of... There's almost no calories in, in broth if it's homemade okay. broth. The biggest problem with broth when people talk about broth isn't the stuff you make yourself. It's the 
commercialized stuff that's full of salt and all kinds of stuff. So, Got it. but you know, as you're describing it, that should be uh, that should be fine. Great. So, over and over, thyroid. Why are so many people now, especially women, seem to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism? Is yeah. that the real reason they can't lose weight? And will a health promoting diet such as the one we recommend and or water fasting help reverse them or, or even get them off medication? Well, they're d diagnosed as hypothyroidism because their immune system has destroyed some or all of their thyroid gland, and that's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And um, the gene, the HLA-DQ gene associated with that disease is also the same gene, coincidentally enough, <coughs> excuse me, that's associated with gluten sensitivity. And one of the theories right now is that when people have HLA-DQ gene and they eat gluten, the body of the immune system begins to attack itself. 1% of the population get what's called celiac disease. Very painful condition involving the intestinal tract. But there's another percentage that don't, the immune system doesn't attack the colon, it seems to attack the thyroid gland. And that may be associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So the idea is that even though you may not have celiac disease, you may still be gluten sensitive. And so for those individuals, they'd be better off without eating wheat, rye, barley, or gluten-rich uh, foods. Other people have sensitivities to other things that may stimulate the immune system to attack itself. That's the nature of autoimmune disease, where the body's immune system attacks itself. There's all kinds of examples. Thyroiditis is one of them. Arthritis, both rheumatoid and osteoarthritis, ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, asthma, eczema, psoriasis. There's a lot of conditions where the body's ability to attack itself seems to be at play. And one of the things all these conditions have in common is gut leakage, where the intestinal tract allows materials to leak through that seem to stimulate the immune system in genetically vulnerable people. So I think one reason we're seeing more of it is because people are getting sicker. Two, we're diagnosing it perhaps more accurately or effectively, you know, doing more testing for it. But, you know, as people are getting fat, sick, and old, they're, you know, looking for an explanation. And, uh, Certainly, hypothyroidism could could have an uh, effect on metabolic factors and contribute at least to a small degree to weight-related issues. But in answer to your question, is that why people are getting fatter and sicker? No, it's because they're eating greasy, fatty, slimy, processed foods, and you know that's why they're getting fatter and that's why they're getting sicker. Yeah. Um, Heidi G says, "You rock," just so you know, and. So, you know, there's a there's a movement for, you know, fat acceptance and healthy at every size. And I recently sh saw yesterday, actually, like I think I called uh, obesity a postmortem. And I'm wondering as a doctor, do you feel that um, you can be fat and fit, that you can have excess adipose tissue and still be healthy? So here's the thing. I don't think the fat's the problem. I think the diet that allows you to stay fat's the problem. So the moment you change your diet, you're in the process of burning the excess fat. You can, your values normalize long before the last bit of fat comes off you. So you don't have to be thin to be healthy. You can be getting healthier every single day, no matter how fat you are. And when you think about it, I mean, fat itself is just extra storage. You know, you were designed to store fat, particularly if you're a woman. You're designed to be able to do that so you can survive periods of vulnerability like pregnancy or, you know, spring coming late. And in a natural setting, fat would never be an issue. It's just because of the excess exposure to highly processed foods that we're able to become obese. So if, if the question is, can fat people be healthy? Yes, fat people can be getting healthier every single day. But in the process of addressing their diet, their fat's going to start going away. And they're going to be losing fat. You know, if you're a woman, you can figure a couple pounds a week is a real common, a real common rate of uh, fat loss. And so, uh, again, I think it's the diet that lets you stay fat that's the real issue, not the fact you're carrying around some extra tissue. Nice, thank you. So, a lot of people. I, I want to make one other point, AJ, is that if you're fat. That means we know one of two things for sure. Number one, your plumbing works. You're able to absorb what you eat. Now, you may not be eating the right stuff, and you may be absorbing too well, but it means you have a healthy absorptive capacity. You're able to absorb stuff, or at least you were up until that moment. 
that's actually in some ways much easier than the person that's underweight and you're having trouble putting weight on. That can be a real big challenge. If a person's not able to absorb their foods and you're having to manipulate the diet trying to get more in there. So when a person's overweight, on a certain level, I kind of relax right out the gate because you already know at least a lot of their important mechanisms work pretty well. And it's much easier and much more successful long term to take an overweight person and help them get thin than to take an underweight person and help them normalize their weight. You can help both people, but it's actually a lot easier working with a person whose primary focus is figuring out how to escape the pleasure trap. Those problems can have both physical and psychological overlay. The underweight person, oftentimes there is a physiological limiting factor, you know, that you're trying to address. So I don't see being overweight um, as a sign that we're going to have trouble getting healthy. Quite the contrary. You know, I see it as a sign that we have to get a person educated properly so they understand the pleasure trap. And once you do that, I think they're doomed to success. I love it. Doomed to success. Thank you. So we have a lot of people, myself included, uh, mostly women that seem to be suffering from bloating, they're diagnosed with IBS, SIBO. Are you seeing a lot of that at True North? And we're not talking about people that are on a standard American diet. We are talking about people like me that eat a health-promoting diet, that don't cheat, that have eaten it for a long time. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we see a disproportionate number of those patients at True North Health because the people that are doing really well aren't necessarily coming and hanging out with us. We're getting the people that are driven by pain, debility, and fear of death, typically. Mm -hmm. So... Um, except maybe 10 days a year during the extravaganza. <laughs> almost, almost everybody we see is pretty motivated. Um, and certainly any kind of uh, microbial disruption is not an uncommon consequence of having been sick, whether it be because of antibiotics, because of poor dietary choices, or just being ill. You know, just having infections and other things can throw everything off in the body. So, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, we see a lot of, and, and, and not everybody responds as quickly as I'd like, but typically these types of microbial imbalances do respond well to the combination of fasting and dietary change. Nice. Thank you. What is your personal take on food addiction? Do you believe that in some people, the refined carbohydrates, specifically sugar, flours, and alcohol, can be addictive? Well, I, I do. I think that... Um, you know, there's lots of different definitions of addiction. And I think there's also different potencies of addiction. I wouldn't say that having sugar is exactly the same as snorting cocaine, you know, in terms of, but I think the pathways largely are similar. So this artificial stimulation of dopamine that happens in the brain from being an addict of any kind, whether it's a drug addict or addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine that comes from chemicals added to our foods like salt, oil, and sugar. So, I think that you can make a pretty good argument for or against this debate, depending on how you want to define addiction and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the, the practical and bottom line is this. People get to the point where the chemicals in their diet, they, they lose the ability to easily control their behavior as a consequence of their participation with them. And so whether it's they're drinking alcohol or they're smoking cigarettes or they're drinking caffeine or they're eating sugar or oil, or highly uh, salted foods, I think all of these ultimately lead to behavioral uh, aberrations, which are probably best described as addiction. And it looks like addiction, it smells like addiction, it tastes like addiction, it behaves like addiction. And so other than some academic debate you might want to have, uh, I think essentially we can consider it addiction. Thank and I you. think that we have to treat it in a similar kind of way uh, in that, um, People have to recognize it's not as simple as just saying, oh, well, I just won't eat that anymore. You know, right. for some people, they can do that. It's just like, for example, some people can say, well, I just won't drink. And other people can't do that. They have to, you know, have a lot more effort. And so for the people that aren't able to easily control it, we call them addicts, you know, or we call it alcoholism or we call it nicotine addiction. Mm -hmm. And some people can say, oh, they'll have a chunk of chocolate and then they don't think about it. And other people, it's not, it doesn't work like that. And so for those, I think they have to recognize that although some people can do that and get away with it, it's not them. And so, you know, to me, that's where the functional definition of addiction comes in. And I think on every level, uh, food fills that um, criteria. 
Well, one of the things I learned from you is that moderation rarely works. And if you're an addict, it never works. So, Well, moderation so is only relevant ever in relation to something that has a normal relationship to the body. Yeah. So, you know, if you're talking about normal behaviors, then certainly we can talk about moderation and need to talk about moderation. But for somebody, for an ex, you know, for an alcoholic, there is no moderation. They, they have to not drink. For Absolutely. most people, perhaps they could talk about moderate use of some of these highly stimulating foods. But for those people that don't have the ability to regulate the control, it doesn't work. So why would we pretend that it's going to work? Because it works for some people, doesn't work for other people? You know, it's just ridiculous. No, people have to recognize their own limitations. And if you're one of those people that has to struggle with it, you'll find it's much easier to just say, okay, I don't do that, than it is to try to figure out how much can I do and not be overwhelmed by it. Why right. would you want to spend your life torturing yourself for some short-term pleasure-seeking self-indulgent behavior when your entire life doesn't have to revolve around those substances? You know, you can just let it go and move right. on and focus on the parts of life that are actually going to increase your happiness potential instead of worrying about your whether or not you're giving up this one short-term pleasure-seeking self-indulgent behavior. Kudos. Brilliant. Yeah, that's like It's like St. Augustine said a long time ago that complete abstinence is much easier than perfect moderation. Well, We've it certainly is for me. With, you know, mm -hmm. If it's not for somebody else, great. I don't like to argue the thing. If, as long as sure. they're successful and getting good long-term outcome data, you know, however they want to put that together. But I, I know from experience working with patients, there's a whole lot of people that have tried this moderation business for a lot of years or decades with absolute abysmal failure. And so at some point, you've got to start asking yourself, you know, maybe it's me and maybe <laughs> I need to make some changes. And I have to ask you this, AJ, what's the big risk? Let's say you decide to adopt a whole food plant-based SOS-free diet in, in, in totality and you fully implement it. Like, what are the consequences, negative consequences of doing that? What Dr. Lyle will tell you, I think rightfully so, is there's another complicating factor called the ego trap. So we have the pleasure trap, which we all acknowledge. This is a problem for people, more so for some than others. But there's also this issue of the ego trap, which is if you tell somebody you have to be perfect, or they'll say, well, I wasn't perfect, so forget everything, and I'll just blow the whole thing out the window. So if you happen to be vulnerable to the ego trap, well, now you may have to come up with a modification of the strategy. But these two things are so powerful, the ego trap and the pleasure trap, that either one of them can trip people off. And so now the question is, how do you do it when you're dealing with both? And the answer is, I say, yes, Dr. Lyle, because I, I don't know, it's very difficult. Well, we have a couple of nice comments online that I'd like to read to you. Uh, we have Elspeth watching live from True North saying she's on day three of a 14-day water fast to cure a chronic skin condition. She says she can't say enough about how wonderful True North is. The doctors are so knowledgeable. The lectures are top-notch. Cooking demos are great, and the support is just what she needs, and she's feeling very optimist optimistic after listening to the countless stories of healing. And Angela wants to know how she can register for this year's holiday extravaganza. Um, well, uh, I'm putting the website up right it's now. It's going to be December 23rd to January 2nd, I think is what we said, right? And uh, it'll be 10 nights. And our special guest will be Chef AJ. And I would recommend a relatively early registration because I will absolutely guarantee that it will be sold out. It has never not sold out in the past. It's never years. not sold out, but this year particularly. Um, True North Health is currently booking June, so <sighs> we're we're definitely you know booking ahead. And so uh, it's um you know we're working hard on trying to increase our ability to handle more people, but right now you know we're limited by our the number of beds available. So. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. So, okay, so almost all the plant-based doctors agree that we shouldn't consume any processed oils. So that's pretty much basic, you know, whole food plant-based 101. And while they agree that sugar and salt are not health foods, you're the only one that recommends adding pretty much, you're pretty much the only one that recommends, recommends adding zero refined sugar. And you're really the only one who's a stickler about salt, because even the doctors that feel that no salt is best, they might allow a little bit of raw coconut aminos or small amounts of low sodium miso. 
And by the way, I agree with you, but I get this question a lot. Why do you take that stance of yeah. just no salt from any source? Well, and understand that uh, most programs are a little bit more flexible as they should be, mm -hmm. um, but we aren't most programs. And in fact, Dr. McDougall uh, refers to us as the punishment. <laughs> um, he says, you know, if somebody's, so let's say that you do the, the McDougal plan, but you know, your blood pressure is not quite low enough or there's not quite the rapidity with the change. He'll, he'll, he'll tell patients that, you know, okay, well, you know, you can try that next, next, uh, intervention like fasting and, and tumor health center. So the people we're seeing are a lot of the people that have done their best on whole food plant-based diets, but for whatever reason, still have health issues or still have challenges. And so we take it to the next level. I also believe that for some people, it's easier to just do it right than it is to try to continue to tease yourself. Now, I'm not saying that's true for everybody. And Dr. Lau would argue there's many people who will be overall more successful if they have a little more flexible you know, program. And if you can be successful with that, great. I got no problem with that. And the fact is, you know, a large number of people do really well on Dr. McDougall's program, Dr. Ornish's program, Dr. Fern's program. But there is definitely a percentage of the population that it's not, the screws are not tight enough to get the problem done or they're sick enough that they need a, a higher degree of intervention and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, so if, if our approach is too strict, uh, people could do our program and then take some salt or sugar and sprinkle that on their food or something and, and if they found that somehow that helped them be more healthy or happy, then, then eh, good luck. Um, that's right. not what we recommend. What we actually recommend is try it as an experiment. We don't, we're not asking people to do this forever, just for 50 years. That's it. So if they stick strictly to the protocol, once they've done a 50-year follow-up, then they can go back and try some other experiment. So we just want to do it long enough that we establish good long-term outcome data, and then they're free to go ahead and, and, and investigate other options after we're done with that. Nice. Thank you. Do you see a, a lot of people coming to True North with cancer and any of them going into remission from fasting? Yeah, we just published a uh, case report in the British Medical Journal actually on the successful treatment of a type of cancer called lymphoma, where a stage 3 follicular lymphoma patient was able to overcome, eliminate their tumors. We now have a two-year follow-up, uh, and we've done all the appropriate diagnostic testing, and this woman is clearly, at this point, cancer-free. We've had other cases with lymphoma that we're also monitoring, and we hope to be able to put together initially a cohort and ultimately a clinical trial showing that at least that type of cancer does respond to fasting and dietary intervention. Um, I think there, we know the cure uh, for cancer, and that, that's prevention. And so the real cure for cancer is learning how to identify the factors that contribute to it and avoiding those factors. The biggest part of that is diet, sleep, and exercise. Right. Terrific. What do you think about the recommendations that some people get that there are certain foods that we absolutely must have every day or we'll die? Like if we don't eat beans every day, if we don't eat nuts every day. Well, of um, course, that's complete nonsense. There's no foods that are critical or essential. You have to have overall integrity of your diet, mm -hmm. uh, be adequate so you get enough calories, protein for essential amino acids, fat for essential fatty acids. You have to have a source of vitamins, minerals, fiber, and water. But there's an infinite number of ways to put that together. I mean, you look at whole cultures that are, some are dependent on potatoes and some are dependent on squash. Some are more rice and beans generated. Some are based on um, even some cultures based on animal foods. You know, they don't tend to live that long. But anyway, so the point is you got a, high, a wide variety of foodstuffs that can provide a sustainable health for humans. And so this idea that some particular class of food is absolutely critical, I think, is not ab absolutely unsupported. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goldhammer, these next few, they're not really questions like, uh, do, by the way, if you like Dr. Goldhammer, and how could you not, he's going to be speaking live at the Ultimate Weight Loss Conference in Las Vegas, uh -huh. September 1st and 2nd, along with Dr. Doug Lyle. They're, that's the only place you can ever see them speak together. It's wonderful. Dr. Barnard is there as well, and you can also ask him your questions there. But we did a little thing where you and Dr. Lyle kind of answered questions quickly, like yes, no, or maybe. So I have a list of things that people ask about, and, and, and you're welcome to go into detail if you want, but a lot of these will just say, you know, 
yes, no, or, or whatever. So for example, you know, in an otherwise healthy person, cup of coffee every day? No. Okay. <laughs> but how do you really feel? A little bit of chocolate? No. All right. Um, using a pressure cooker if it's going to help you eat more vegetables. Maybe? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Okay, same thing with a with an air fryer, if it's going to help you eat more vegetables. You know, how, what's the temperature these air fryers you're talking about going at now? So believe it or not, you can set the temperature of your air fryer as low as you want, or as, at least the one I have goes up to 400 and it goes down to whatever. Well, here's, here's what my thinking is in general, and this is my concern about pressure cookers, which is less of an issue than the air fryer, but mm -hmm. when you cook foods, vegetable foods, you're cooking at 212 degrees. Even if you're baking a potato in the oven, the potato itself is cooking at 212 degrees unless you burn it, mm -hmm. okay, unless you burn it. So we know that 212 degrees works really well. We don't get a lot of byproducts or concerns or issues or whatever. When we go into a pressure cooker, the way it cooks quicker is we increase the temperature which we're cooking to 250 degrees. So now the food's cooking at 250. It's not absolutely clear. That, let's put it this way. There's no overwhelming evidence that that's a problem. But it's not absolutely clear or proven that that's as desirable as 212, that there may be potential issues at 250 that you wouldn't find at 212. Now, compared to not eating plant foods and the convenience and all that other stuff, I'm not going to argue that there may be huge net benefits to cooking it at 250 because of the convenience factors and all the other variables. But I wouldn't say it's a like accepted science that 250s is 100% as, uh, as safe, effective, or efficient as 212 as far as nutrition is concerned. And now when we start talking about increasing temperature up to several hundred degrees, or in some cases up to 1,000 degrees, like on commercial air fryers where they're making, now we're talking about more acrylamides and more other more byproducts that maybe they will or maybe they won't turn out to be significant health issues. I would reserve my judgment on that until the research is actually done and the analysis is actually done to see is there enough additional acrylamides, for example, when you air fry at 1,000 degrees or 250 or 400, you know what I mean? Um, I don't think we're going to find a whole lot from pressure cooking, okay? But it, we may find, especially with dry cooking, there are potential issues. So my answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. And until I okay. do, I don't think we'll introduce those tools at the center. Sure. Okay. Uh, just quickly, people are saying, why no coffee? Why no chocolate? They're even saying, well, why no coffee? Coffee is a highly addictive nervous system stimulant. It has a 17-hour half-life. The coffee you drink in the morning, the caffeine that contain, it contains – will affect sleep quality issues as much as 17 hours later. Ask anybody with gastritis how they feel about drinking coffee, including decaf. It's very irritating the intestinal mucosa. It's just as irritating to you, but you happen to maybe not have the sensitivity uh, to be aware of it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of any kind of drug, including caffeine, and I don't like the chemicals they use to decaffeinate the stuff. There's 2,000 other chemicals in coffee, none of which are necessarily particularly desirable. The fact there happen to be a few positive phytochemicals, because it is a plant-based food, doesn't necessarily override the negative. So my attitude is why would we want to include any of these substances that can have so many detrimental effects? Why? Because people are drug addicts and they like the effect of it. Absolutely. So I have a simple rule, H.A. You know, you don't need to even read anything. All you need to do is get patients to go inside themselves and say, just get very quiet and look at something and think, do I really truly want and need that substance? And if the answer truly is yes, then they should know. They can't have it. Right, exactly. So chocolate's a no-go. Chocolate's absolutely a no-go. If you have to have chocolate, here's how to take it. Melt the chocolate down into a liquid. Rub it all over your belly and hips where it's going to end up. And then when you're done, you can wash it off and not carry it around all week. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, Air pop popcorn. Well, now you're talking about 1,800 calories a pound of highly processed food. However, if caloric density is not an issue, if you're not worried about weight issues, you're not, and you're trying to do some entertainment feeding of kids and distract them from all the 50 other things that are far worse, I wouldn't have an objection to air popped, not oil pop, but air pop popcorn 
as some kind of a, a healthier junk food, you know, fill in the gap kind of thing. But if you're trying to lose weight, you wouldn't want to be making pop, pop, you know, popcorn kind of a staple because it's a highly concentrated, highly processed food. There's nothing particularly good about it. It's just way less bad than so many other things people eat. But I wouldn't like get fooled into thinking because there's not it's light that it's not calorically dense because it's of course very calorically dense. Yeah, exactly. And chocolate's calorically dense too. But people are saying, well, what about if it's raw cacao beans or dark chocolate? And yeah, bless it by the guru, and everything will be fine. Like you can still melt it down, rub it on your belly and right. hips. Okay. Um, uh, tortillas like corn tortillas. Well, tortillas are one of those intermediate foods. If weight was not an issue, if you're feeding kids and you're trying to get more caloric density and you want to make tostadas with baked, organically grown tortillas, I don't have a problem with that. But it is a highly concentrated food. So if you're trying to lose weight and you include something like tortilla, then you'd have to go back to portion control. You can't just eat till you're full of tortillas because you'll eat significantly more percentage of calories than you would Mm -hmm. Otherwise, so that would be the thing. If you happen to have the discipline to say, well, I'm just going to have one or two and this is part of this meal and I um, I won't go and eat more, you know, that could be an option. I don't object to them from a basic nutrition standpoint, but they are a highly processed food. You know, anything that's been turned into a flour is going to increase its caloric density and be vulnerable to those of us that are trying to maintain weight. Now, let's say you're trying to gain weight, though. Let's say you've got, you're trying to get, you know, an extra 500 calories into somebody. That's exactly the kind of thing you could do. You could use some rice pasta or some corn tortillas or you could, you know, again, we're talking about, let's be clear, we're not talking about fried oil, salty processed stuff. We're talking about tortillas that were baked and used as a part of a whole natural food meal. That might be a way of increasing caloric density. What about? I have a guest on most of the people listening to your broadcast are probably not struggling with weight gain. No, <laughs> most of the people aren't. What about the bean flours and the bean pastas? Same thing. You know, it's a highly concentrated processed food. If you're able to digest them, if calories are not the issue, uh, you use them as a in a portion controlled part of the diet. They may be perfectly reasonable. Right. Well, I find that the people that suffer from the refined food addiction can do well with beans, but not once it's processed into a flour. Oh, or absolutely pasta. no. I mean, but beans, whole beans, are usually. Sure. You know, other than people that have digestive challenges usually are well tolerated. But it's anything you turn into a flour, right. you're saying, That's how fat do I want to be? Right. That's I always have you. Any time I'm ever tempted to stray, which I've only done once since meeting you, I think about you saying to someone who asked a question about how much of this highly addictive substance they could have. And you said, how fat and sick do you want to be? And that's what I use right. as my measurement. So thank you. I've been encouraging my patients to use little subtle reminder uh, cues to help keep them motivated. I suggest people, for example, get a really nice uh, adult diaper and stick that on their refrigerator. And so it's a, a reminder of what, what they're going to need later if they don't take care of business with their diet well, it's lifestyle. It's interesting because Shirley said we need Dr. Goldhammer standing in front of the refrigerator. I actually have this in fr on my refrigerator. <laughs> and then I have these all over the house. Uh -huh. and well, you know, I, I have the gold it. hammer bobblehead that always says no. And you know how you know how I know you have grandchildren. You know how a lot, a lot of times children like to wear t-shirts with their favorite superhero on it? Well, I, I do the same thing. I wear t-shirts with my superhero on it. Well, I think what you should do, AJ, is you should market the True North Health salt shaker. And it's a, a an attractive salt shaker that's full of salt, but there's no holes in the top. Oh, that's a great idea. So you just keep shaking as much as you want. And they'll get their exercise that way, too. Absolutely. That is terrific. Uh, how do you feel about routine screenings, PSA, mammograms, colonoscopy? So Who here's the deal. There's not a lot of um, – there's not a lot of good good evidence that most of these things help people live longer or better except to the degree they might motivate people to adopt diet and lifestyle changes. So if you need to get a test done so it scares you, so that you adopt a whole plant food, SOS-free diet, begin to sleep and exercise properly, I guess there would be some uh, potential benefit. The problem is most of these tests are designed to stimulate various types of medical behavior, which have uh, very questionable outcomes. So, you know, if you're doing a mammogram under the idea that, well, then I'll have early detection and therefore early treatment and now I'm going to live longer, you may be disappointed when you read Mikaraji's book, 
the emperor of all maladies and look at the facts. So to a degree that screening can be helpful at helping people understand the limitations of the behaviors, I don't have a problem with it. But to the degree that it's used to manipulate people into buying more medical care that they may or may not need, there may be more harm than good done by many of these procedures. Great. What uh, I know you said it's not safe for people to do a water fast at home, but what if they wanted to, to say do a, do a juice fast at home? Well, modified feeding can always be done, of course. If people are getting uh, a minimum of 600 calories and resting, they can generally do that. I would say, though, that just the diet change, just eating a whole diet can be a very dangerous process if people are on medications that aren't appropriately modified. So, for example, most people are being drugged for their diets, not their condition. And the moment they change their diets, they have to work with their physicians at reducing the amount of toxic waste that they're being poisoned with. And if they don't, they can actually get problems just because now they're over-medicated. So the problems are not because people want to eat healthy diets at home and, and all that kind of stuff. It's because of the consequences of their medical treatment. So I don't have any problem with people adopting health-promoting diet anytime, but they still want to get appropriate medical management done of the treatments that they're currently on until they're successfully eliminating the need for them. Great. What do you think of this master cleanse that people do where they drink nothing but water, maple syrup, lemon, and cayenne yeah, pepper? I'm never a big fan of making the body kind of throw up and pretending that that's some kind of healing response. So, you know, they people take olive oil and they make little soap balls and they pretend that that's gallstones and they do various types of, quote, cleanses, which are nothing more than creating some irritation and having the body go through an acute response. That's not really uh, a cleansing response in the way that we would describe it, where you're mobilizing intermediary products and metabolism, giving the body through the process of filtering the blood with the kidneys the ability to eliminate those toxins. It's just basically stirring up the muck. And so it's right. not, I don't advocate it, I don't recommend it. Uh, I know yeah. a lot other people do, but that's good because if they were right about everything, what would they need us for? Right. What about rice? We've been scared against rice. White, ra brown, red, black. Well, what I would say that rice naturally sucks up stuff that's in the soil and the water. And so I wouldn't want to buy rice that was raised on land that used to be poisoned when it was they were raising cotton, for example, because they used these arsenic-rich pesticides. Because rice would have a more tendency than other grains, for example, to accumulate that. So in our practice, we purchase organically grown rice grown in California. There, there's never been cotton and arsenic-based pesticides dominating in California. So we, we buy organically grown rice, try to minimize the exposure that way. And also there's ways in preparing rice. If you're really concerned about arsenic in particular, if you prepare rice like you would a soup, you can dramatically reduce the likelihood of um, any carryover. The downside to that is it also reduces some of the other really important minerals that are naturally present in rice. So it's not without its consequences. But personally, I recognize that there are materials in all foods. Um, the people that should be worried about these issues, though, are not the vegans. It's the meat eaters, because animal foods biologically concentrate materials in their tissues. So, you know, an animal food could have two to a thousand times the concentration of various substances that plant-based foods do. Not that we don't want organically grown plant foods and not that there aren't concerns and legitimate concerns about the various behavioral tendencies of different plants and their ability to bioaccumulate materials in the environment. But remember, those it's not the rice that's the problem. It's whatever other people happen to be spraying into the soil that creates the challenge. And so we use rice as a part of our um, health promoting diet. Do you think that we have to be worried about eating like red or black rice because it has more nutrients or eating this potato over this potato? Well, you don't have to worry about anything that? for nutrient density if it's whole natural foods. You can get plenty. But I do like Thank the you. idea of a variety of foods because not mm -hmm. every food has exactly the same concentration and balance. So over the course of the year, getting a wide variety of these delicious, delectable, and, and lovely foods I think helps ensure us a variety of nutrients and comp compensates and offsets a lot of the individual variations that we might otherwise be vulnerable to. Right. I believe you've had like over 30,000 people come to the center in the last 32 years, something like that. Is that correct? And maybe 10,000 of them have fasted. I, I don't know if I have my figures exactly right. Well, we've right, had almost, I believe we're now close to 20,000 people having fasted. Wow. So, so you, you've seen a lot of patients. I've seen and a lot of patients. We see over 1,000 fasting patients a year now. Wow. So that's, that's an unbelievable. Congratulations. My understanding is, is that when you've seen people eat a whole 
the diet you recommend, SOS free, whole food, plant based, it never doesn't work while they're in Santa Rosa. The magical. Well, no, I, I wouldn't say that something ever never doesn't work. What I say is that you have to remember we're pretty mm -hmm. selective about who we treat. Mm -hmm. So we tend to try to take conditions we expect to have good results. There's a lot of people we don't take. So it may be this approach wouldn't work with all kinds of people, but we're pretty good at selecting the people. There are patients that come in and do things right and we struggle with them. There's no question. But of the conditions that we treat, no, the vast majority of the people tend to respond. Sometimes it takes longer than others. Sometimes it'll be several stays before you get them in shape. But overall, our results are good. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, is my, my question really about the environment and how critical do you think it is to a person's long-term success? Because it's fairly easy while you're being served all the delicious meals at True North to do the right thing. But often we people get into environments with yeah. husbands and children that refuse to eat this well, way. We've been thinking maybe the answer is not to let people go home anymore <laughs> because that seems to be where we get into trouble. Once they're here at the center over enough time, they tend to get well. And as long as they're staying at the center, they tend to stay well. So we're thinking now maybe the answer would be just keep everybody here. And that way we wouldn't have this drop-off problem or this temptation problem. And then if they want to see the husband, the husband can come here and then become part of the whole thing. So that, that may be a new strategy for us. Wow. Okay. So, but, but you're kidding, right? I mean, <laughs> cause then you'd never be able to take new patients. So, so well, I, maybe we just need to keep getting a little bit more space and then, right. you know, expanding into the surrounding right. area. I mean, do you think there's just some people, uh, th there are people that, that can't seem to follow this, at least even on my program for one day and they continue to relapse. Are, are there people for which you think there's just no hope? No, I think there's hope for everybody. They have to be appropriately motivated. I think your problem, AJ, is you're not getting them sick enough. <laughs> if people are driven by pain, debility, and fear of death, they're generally pretty motivated. If your patients are not compliant, I would say they're not in enough pain. Right. So I think maybe we need a new medication that causes the kind of inordinate pain that a lot of our patients are in, and you could give them that, and then they would be motivated. So maybe they're not yet fat enough or sick enough. Right. I think that it really takes motivation. And, you know, some people happen to have really high tolerances, and so they can get away with huge amounts of debility before they become appropriately motivated. But there is a point, and I'll give you an example, okay? Example is my brother. Now, my brother, Mark, um, I've known for all my life, and he's known me. In fact, his wife, who I love, is was ill over 15 years ago, came to the center, fasted, recovered, and adopted a vegan diet, and has been a vegan since then, okay? So now we're talking... 15 years or more. My brother, no. No, not not doing it. You know, eating his other stuff, getting fatter and fatter and sicker and fatter. And doesn't matter. I talked to him. I did my best. Not interested. His wife's doing the program. Not interested. And then he called me up the other day. He was in the hospital. He'd had a heart attack. So my brother has a heart attack. And, of course, I'm just excited as hell because I know this is the one shot we've got now to get him to make some changes. And he's telling me he's having this heart attack and they're telling him he has to have bypass surgery. And I'm telling him, oh, that's wonderful. And he said, you're not supposed to be happy I had a heart attack. <laughs> I said, I know, I know, that's wonderful. I'm so excited. And um, so anyway, he talks to his bypass surgeon and he says, well, if you do this bypass surgery, won't those vessels just plug up again? And he says, yeah. And he says, well, what if I change my diet? And he said, the surgeon laughed at him. He said, you're not going to change your diet. So long story short, he changes his diet. He's now lost 35 pounds. He's under 200 pounds. He passed his stretch test uh, two months later. He doesn't have to have any procedures. And he's feeling great. He's back to playing volleyball. His uh, knee that had been limiting his ability to even walk up the steps has improved a lot. He's diligently following the program. And so fortunately, he knew enough to ask and get some facts about the condition. And he's stubborn enough now that he's willing to stick to the program. But, you know, here is my brother. I can't manage to convince to make these changes despite the fact his wife's already doing it. She, I am totally sympathetic to how frustrating it is to have people that you love that are reluctant or resistant to implement these changes. 
but they have to be motivated and you can't necessarily motivate them. They have to be motivated by pain, debility, fear of death. Those are the effective strategies. Now, in my brother's case, fortunately, he didn't suffer much damage as a consequence of this heart attack. And so it was enough to scare him without actually to debilitate him. So now he's going to do very well in the long run. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and no, I'm very happy about that. What a blessing. But, but, but I think you and I have both known people that do have impending fear of death or limb amputation, and they still don't make the change. Well, sometimes it's the third heart attack where they'll get appropriately motivated. And yeah. sometimes it's the, you know, when the, di the dialysis no longer works and they have to get a transplant. Mm. And then they're motivated. Now, the problem is if you wait too long, you don't get as satisfactory a result. It's true. So it really makes a little more sense to try to get motivated earlier on. But, you know, people have a lot of, like some people, even a little bit of pain is enough to scare them and they, they jump right on it. But other people have high pain thresholds. So they, it takes a lot of ability to motivate them. Yeah. Some of that so, I think is genetic. Yeah. We have a lot of people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program that have a lifelong history of discordant eating, anorexia, bulimia, mixed. Um, they're not a really a good candidate for fasting, right? Especially if the bulimia is active. Well, I think it depends. That's an individual decision that has to be made for each patient. But typically, uh, people that are active bulimic patients, you wouldn't be doing water-only fasting as the first thing out of the gate. There's 16 other things you want to deal with before you would take on something that vigorous. Water fasting can be an intense and miserable process. It can be safe and effective when it's done properly, but you wouldn't impose it unless it's going to have a net benefit. And, you know, that's one of the things I think that we're very good at the True North Health Center at is that mm -hmm. we can help people identify where it might actually be helpful and where it would not necessarily be helpful. And we don't do fasting in people. We don't think it's going to be helpful. Right. What do you say to this doctor? I don't even know his name. That's telling everybody not to not to eat lectins, that that's the that's the problem. The plant paradox. Well, I, think. I think, you know, the fact is there are some people that are a little sensitive to d different proteins. And for those people, it's probably good advice. The problem is just because one person has a sensitivity doesn't mean necessarily everybody has a sensitivity. So if a person has a question about it, it's simple enough. They can withhold those particular products for a while, use the starchy vegetable products more uh, abundantly, and then they could try to, you know, once their symptoms are resolved or not, they could try rotating foods in to determine if they have sensitivities. But this idea that everybody is, you know, incapable of digesting grains, I think, is not accurate. Right. What do you say to your patients that struggle with cravings, either from the detox and withdrawal of the sugar or the monthly cravings for chocolate from their menstrual cycle? How do you help your patients deal with cravings? Oh, well, I think we try to help people understand that, you know, cravings are a part of uh, imbalances. So if the, in, the cravings are coming from sugar or insulin imbalances, we have to get rid of the reason for the hypo or hypoglycemic response. If it's coming from their estradiol not breaking down to estriol properly and, and accumulating, then we have to teach them how to help that and get that gut flora normalized or how to reestablish normal hormonal balance. And so we always resort to doing kind of dangerous and radical things like getting people to eat well, exercise, go to bed on time. And if it doesn't happen quickly enough, we use fasting. Nice. Nice. One of the most profound things you ever said to me it, it, when somebody was asking you why they're so fat at True North, uh, this, I mean, this was an actual Q&A, &A, and you said, show me an overweight person, and I'll show you someone who is unwilling to eat enough raw salad or steamed vegetables. Well, if you eat enough raw fruits, uh, vegetables, salad, and steamed vegetables, usually there's not much room left for anything else. So by definition, if you're still overweight and you're not losing weight, you're eating too much concentrated food and not enough lower density food. So eat more. You know, people don't understand that if you want to lose weight, there's two important things. Eat more and sleep more. Mm -hmm. Get enough rest so you have enough energy to exercise and eat enough low density food so there's no room for anything else. Can you guess how many, how many, how much this is? Like how many pounds of zucchini this is? I would say that looks like about a pound and a half of zucchini. You are, you're like really smart. This was two pounds of zucchini that I roasted in the oven. There's two pounds These of zucchini, you got about 400 calories or something. 400 calories, zucchini is 72 calories a pound. So 140 calories. 
the point I'm trying to make is I don't know if you can see this is a very small plate. This is not this is not a true north dinner plate. This is not very much food. And people say they couldn't possibly eat this oh, much no food. Goodness. If you blended that up, it's not even a glass full of juice. So what I are know. you talking this, about? No, this, is that two pounds? Is that two pounds pre cooked or post cooked? I started with two pounds of zucchini and I, okay. I lightly roasted it in the oven. Okay, so that's 150 calories. Right. So you would have is, to eat that is, like 10 times a day and you'd still be losing weight. I mean, I'm starving after I eat this and then I usually eat another pound or two of vegetables. And, and people say, oh, they could never eat a pound of vegetables. This is two pounds of organic cherry tomatoes. This is exactly two cups and people don't understand it's not that much food right well they're thinking when they think about a pound of food though they're thinking a pound of chocolate or something you know which would be mm -hmm. a pretty fulling meal 2500 calories it's a couple days worth of calories so which would be huh yeah you know one of the cool things you wrote in the pleasure trap was, uh because you know ever since meeting you and dr lyle i've completely changed how i feel about emotional eating as even being a real thing and you always talk about how if you feed a rat bread and chocolate in 60 days they gain 49 percent of their weight and it's not because of any emotional trauma in their past or stress in their present and uh that that was really helpful so thank you yeah, I don't think it's, I think it's also true for people. If you put emotionally scarred tissue damaged people in an environment where they have nothing to eat but the stuff like you just had on your plate, guess what? They'll figure out how to eat enough not to die and they're going to lose two to three pounds a week down to their optimum weight, regardless yep. of their emotional issues. The only thing the emotional issues, in my opinion, do is it makes it more difficult to make good choices. So if you have a lot of emotional nourishment in your life and people are supportive of you and everything's easy and wonderful. The ability to make good choices each and every day is easier than if you're living in a high stress environment and you have to put up with all kinds of crap. You're driving to a job you hate. You're working with people you don't like. There's temptation all around you. Then it's harder to make the good decisions. And so it's not that stress doesn't play an important role. It clearly does, but it's not the limiting factor. Because, like I said, if, this, if the choices are eliminated you, and you only have one choice, you choose that, regardless of how screwed up you are. Yeah, exactly. So some of the doctors say that the negative effects of the sodium are, are mitigated by the positive effects of the fermented soy and things like that. Oh, miso. come on. Give me a break. You know, the fact is you got something that's good and something that's bad, and we're going to pretend that it balances itself out. Salt is a powerful stimulant of passive overeating. I know. Passive overeating is an important part of staying fat. If you're right. trying to not stay fat, you need to get rid of passive overeating, and salt is a part of that. And there's no reason you need to have the damn salt because you can make all these ferments without any salt. Absolutely. You can have pickles without any salt. You can have coleslaw or is coleslaw without any uh, uh, salt. That's absolutely. Kimchi, uh, sauerkraut. Yeah, yeah, you can do whatever you want to do. You just but This is just an excuse. But they opinion. say they don't like the taste of their food without well, salt. Well, of course they don't like the taste of their food without salt because they're addicts and it takes 30 days on average to adapt to a low salt diet a little quicker if you do fasting. So you have to suck it up for a month. What are they worried? They're going to lose too much weight during the time that they're adapting to the lower diet? I don't think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on eating when hungry and stopping when full rather than eating, weighing and measuring your food several times a day? And, and you know, there's these programs now that have gained, regained in popularity where they're, where they're not where hunger has nothing to do with it, because they say that people that are addicts, we can't tell if we're hungry. We can't tell if we're well, I full. think that if you eat a whole food diet, you'll find you'll get back more in touch with your apostatic mechanisms. Um, unfortunately, AJ, I have to wrap it up right now because I just got a call from my wife and I never want to leave my wife waiting. Well, absolutely. So, so thank I you didn't so allocate much. enough time, but I'll be more than happy to come, to come back. back. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. More questions. Else, but you're just people love you so much. So thank you so much, Dr. Goldhammer. Yeah. If you want more information on True North, please go to the True North website. I will post it right now. It's www healthpromoting.com and you can fill out the patient intake form and Dr. Goldhammer will be happy to give you a free consultation to see if True North is right for you. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ. I make healthy, taste delicious. Bye, Dr. Goldhammer.